I'm great. Awesome to be with you. Thanks for having me, man. Oh, for sure, man. I want to give a shout out really quick as well to uh, Gail and Adina Hodges with Kingdom Talks. And that's where I found out about your work, seeing you uh, on yeah. the show and being interviewed by them and uh, fell in love with what you're bringing to the table. Been able to check out a bunch of your live streams and some of the information that you've been bringing to the table as well. So shout out to them. And uh, yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I really love those people and what they're doing for the kingdom, especially. Yeah, they're great you know, the mystical and, and the unity and the um, the oneness of our, our relationship with Christ and relationships with one another, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so They're amazing people. 
Yeah, man. Let's so let's just uh start off with I guess just kind of introducing yourself to the audience, people who there's people who already know who you are, who are here reading in the comment section. But for those who have no idea who you are, what you bring to the table, just kind of give like an over overview of who you are, what you do. Yeah. So my wife and I, we spent over 21 years uh, doing university ministry. So that was kind of our our world for a really long time. And so I'm really passionate about thinking and believing. So we can be an intellectual and mystical. We don't have to choose one or the other. And so that really began to to form a lot of the stuff that the Lord's brought brought me into my personal journey and just in helping others. And then after we did university ministry, we've continued to do mentorships. I do a mystical mentorship with a good friend. I've always traveled and speak. So I, I speak and train all over the world and uh, an author, have a family, I have two kids, 13 year old daughter and a nine year old son. We live in San Diego, California, and we, we love each other and we love Jesus. <laughs> awesome. That's what's up, man. That's what it's about. Um, yeah. So getting into the mystical and, and I say getting into the mystical, let's just start again with, I think it ties in with being a believer, right? Tapping into to Christ. Where did all of this stuff start for you? Um, I, I, I like to trace everything back to childhood. Did you ever have yeah. any childhood experiences that were like otherworldly that kind of marked you that when once you begin to grow up and you start looking into some of these other realms and things like that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I grew up in Michigan, grew up in a Christian home, and it was a, a Pentecostal church. So there was a grid for healing and a grid for speaking in tongues. But, you know, outside of that, there wasn't a whole lot of grid for, you know, otherworldly angelic encounters. And so as a kid, I was seeing angels and demons and dimensions and all sorts of stuff, dreaming about stuff that would happen in the future. And, you know, and I would share it. And I could tell it didn't seem like very few, if anyone else was seeing this stuff. So it, it kind of, you know, there came a tipping point, really. It was one specific dream I had. And I saw the fear in my mom's eye when she looked at me because this thing happened. And it was our neighbor and who got paralyzed from the neck down in this dream that happened the next day. And so... When I saw that fear, I was I started to push away from it because maybe there's something wrong with this. Like, why am I seeing these things? Why why is this happening in and around my life? But I don't it doesn't seem to be happening to anybody else. And so that shut down for a while. But as a child, I was I was seeing stuff all the time. It was a bit overwhelming. There really wasn't help to process that stuff. There was very little resources back in that day on any of this any of these topics. And so that's why I've. I'm so passionate about helping people to process and to understand that, hey, this is, we don't have to be afraid. <laughs> There's a lot that the Lord wants to show us. So uh, what led you to start pursuing it? Like, uh, was it was it a certain ministry that you got into that you found about, a book that opened up to you, or just something that you couldn't control and had to learn by yourself, or a little bit of all of it? What was it for you that really made you confident like this was something that was of God and I should uh, learn about yeah. it and pursue it. I think two instances there was probably the most radical encounter I've ever had in 1995 it was in Pensacola Florida not too far from you uh, the Brown of Brownsville revival back in the day Heck yeah and you know I was super jaded I was actually making mm -hmm. fun of anything supernatural super critical it's a long story, but I had this crazy encounter with God at, at this front of this church. Didn't even want to be there. I was judging everything that was happening around me. And so I was mugged by God. I wasn't even asking for this. You know, he just came in and out of that encounter, everything came back that I'd pushed away from. And the Lord began to teach, you know, put, put me on this journey to be like, hey, this it was always me. It was you never had to be afraid. And then from there, moved to Salt Lake City, Utah to help start a church and do campus ministry at University of Utah. And dude, that environment is super intense, man. I mean, the first week I got there, I had a principality come in my room, said, I'm going to kill you if you don't leave the state. You know, and it's like, you don't learn this stuff in Bible college, what to do. And so Salt Lake City really was a training ground and a lot of the stuff quite honestly, because 
I had to. It was such an intense spiritual environment. It was like, all right, Lord, let's do this. Let's go on the deep dive. And so I spent eight years, got married there. And so my wife and I really, we, we feel like that was kind of the, the training ground for where we are today. What were some of the materials and stuff early on for you? Did you get into like the final quest and Morning Star Ministries and stuff like that? Yeah, I remember the final quest. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there was, you know, Randy Clark came out when we were in Utah in 1990, man, 97, I think, or 98. I didn't know who that was, you know, back then. So he's sharing stories that just, I mean, specifically about healing. And I was like, you know, I was pretty new to this stuff. So I was like, well, I went up to him and said, there's only 10 of us there. And I said, look, whatever is going on in your life, like I kind of want that too. So I don't know how this works. So he prayed and man, I went flying. It's as if I got electrocuted, went flying <laughs> on the ground, like five feet into the wall and started seeing people get healed. I've been praying for people to be healed. Wasn't seeing a lot of stuff. And now the outcomes were incredible just because of that place of impartation. So I think Randy was pretty key for me. Obviously the morning star, I mean, morning star worship was a big part of the church that they we were like start. The Bethel, you know, before yeah, yeah. they actually raised a lot of Bethel people up. They went to, to their school of ministry and stuff. So yeah, super impactful. They're very long worship songs that are 20, 25 minutes long. <laughs> Heck yeah. You can get lost <laughs> in it. It's kind of like a meditation, right. a dance. <laughs> it's something, you know what? Like I think a good worship song is something like what morning star brought to the table. Obviously like they, had a bunch of Celtic influences and tribal yeah. influences and rock and roll. Like they just put everything in it. But I think their music was good because, or is good because they allow you to experience like a roller coaster of emotions. Like there's yeah. a, there's all of these high points and then there's travail and then there's declaration, <laughs> all of these in the span of a 20 minute song, yeah. almost like a good movie. Like a good yeah. movie is one that's going to make you laugh and cry. Like at the same time, even it's going to allow you to feel present, feel like you're a human and be able to process and feel all of these emotions. Like <laughs> there, there's some movies coming out that are really, really like well written. And then a lot of these like Game of Thrones or Walking Dead or something that kind of make you feel the, the same way. But then again, like yeah. tapping into worship, like bringing that element that just makes you feel alive and makes you feel like process and helps you process all of those feelings in a safe atmosphere. That was something that was really cool about that oh, music. Yeah. And again, I think Bethel's doing that too. I actually had Leonard Jones on here. I interviewed him uh, oh, awesome. about a year ago. It was really cool. So that's super cool. What is it about the feelings though? Because there's so many, I I'm really big on being present, like embracing our, um, godhood embracing our, our spirit man and that we are eternal beings we are light beings we are seated with christ in heavenly places we can leave the body at, at will you know all of these things but then again it's like being present in the body to eat good food to enjoy good company to process emotions to cry to laugh to be angry but then we you know, have, yeah. we have to respond with love to all, in all of these things. So there's a movement of people that's very much a Gnostic idea that anything that is of the world or from the earth is wicked and contaminated oh, yeah. and corrupt and our feelings and our flesh is corrupt and things like that and we shouldn't enjoy it. Have you noticed any of those segments of, of people? Oh, yeah. Or, it's kind of creeped know, in even to some of the mystical movements for people who mean well, I think, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, Gnosticism is deeply rooted. It's been around for so long and it continues to survive in different streams. But to me, it's like I, some of the people I've met, it's kind of a, an escape for them to escape the pain of stuff they've encountered. That they, This is a way I don't have to move on from it because I can just to completely disconnect. Is that so and you're talking me, about the ascension stuff is a way like escapism? Absolutely. For and to me, it's... Yeah. It's this is the ascended life is affecting all of life, not just, you know, oh, I'm up in the spiritual realms and doing all this cool stuff. And yeah. it's like, well, how how's your relationship with your spouse or how, you know, what does that look like in your daily life? When's the last time you listen to somebody, yeah. you know, who brings feedback in your life? And it's like, oh, well, brother, you know, that I'm, I'm ascended. I'm like, no, you're not. If, if those aren't <laughs> a part of your life. That's a low level of living, yeah. and I think it is for some a way to escape this yeah. this world because they don't want to process. 
the things yeah. they need to. You know, I think there's a there's a, a a balance that has to be there because it is it is escapism, right? Like we need to escape to something. Who, who do you who and what do you run to? You know, for for a time it was drugs, it was alcohol. For some, it's it's women. You know, it's uh, se- sexual immorality. They they run food is something that people escape to. Like, what do you escape to? So for us, when we're under attack, when we're feeling, especially right now. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who are escaping in conspiracy theories yeah. and fantasy worlds. And, and, and even with the ascended life being somewhat of a fantasy world and, well, I met with three prophets today and I rode the back of a dragon or whatever. It's like this far out stuff that it's like it's a escapism, but it has no impact on reality. You know what I'm saying? And because, yeah. you know, he is our strong tower. He is our shelter from the storm. He is our, our our safe haven, right? So we should run to him and run to spending time in his presence. But then again, there's the ones who maybe always stay there that they never come back down the mountain like Moses with the message or Jesus mm-hmm. come out of the wilderness with a message, you know? So I think that uh, there's a balance there of, of still having impact and renown in the earth because you've sought the father in secret, then he rewards you openly with, with his presence and with all of these things that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you said it, you know, Jesus came down the mountain and he tangibly touched people. He fed people. He ate with people. He drank with people. It's like he, you know, he's, he is the standard of a mystical life and he is, he's modeling how we can live multidimensionally. Yeah. We have these encounters, but it is ground out into a tangible expression in the earth. Always, uh, you know, looking back at like the weight of God's glory and, and even looking back at the Old Testament and seeing how he did these mighty miracles and mighty ways of provision and made a way where there is no way for them and, and how they always, you know, they would turn their back or they would get uh, bored or whatever the case is or like they would turn to other gods and stuff like that. And obviously that's a mirror for our lives as well when just, the, you know, all the miracles and things we've seen, whether it's otherworldly or not, I think that, I think that being a mystic and being one who's connected, you can see the beauty and majesty in all things that that you can see God in it, all his fingerprint, and it's just majestic. But, uh, you know, leaving your body, having angelic encounters and stuff like that, like how much is enough? Like how much until we get the message and run with it versus like I need more? I feel like in, in the movement and stuff, there's a lot of people who are spoiled, you know, because they and they just they're spoiled because they have access because they can, you know, uh, enter trance state or whatever or laugh and fall out or whatever. It is different for different people um, versus something that, again, is going to be something that they can pull out and apply to their life. I always talk about, you know, I talk to all kind of people, but like uh, the definition of a mystic or a shaman is one who's able to pull things out of the spirit realm and apply it to your life and go in and those dreams and those visions and manifest them and, and be able to execute them. And then, and for a lot of people. So what we're encountering, and I think for me, I, I find some people they're pursuing encounters yeah. and I'm like, look, if, if my suit is the heart of the father, encountering things because I have legal access to that because of the finished work of Christ. And, you know, my encouragement to you, anyone that's listening and watching is, make your highest pursuit first love and he will show you tremendous things because he can trust you with the level of revelation he wants to bring to someone who is his heart is the pursuit. His mind is your pursuit. Now, um, this just this random, but what about kissing and telling? What about, do you ever feel like you should have kept some of these things to yourself versus just like, oh yeah, this is what we did. Yeah, I was in the spirit and this is what we did. It's kind of like just sh- like these beautiful, intimate <laughs> secrets that the Lord shared with you. And then here we are like talking about them openly. I I, I do, I, I had a, a deep encounter about that. It was like, oh, you're the one who's talking about leaving your body and traveling to heaven. And you're the ones talking about the mysteries and you're just throwing them out just to random people and talking about it like it's nonchalant like isn't there like a uh you know just like a it's, it's holy it's sacred it, it's set apart it cost even versus just like hey anyone could do it tap in like it comes with a level of responsibility at least i believe it should right yeah i mean i i kind of say sometimes you have to be drunk in a spirit because you'll be sobered by what you see 
going in and there, there is a responsibility to this and it's not to be just this nonchalant. And I, I remember one encounter I had and I started sharing it and I got so much backlash and God said, Hey, so did I tell you to share that? And I was yeah. like, uh, <laughs> yeah, he said, it's not the right time. And that was between us. And so I had to, I had to go back to him and be like, all right, help me to understand how to do this, to not, to know what to share and know what not to share. Yeah. I mean, this kind of what this platform is built around. It's about just kind of exploring the mystical and, and talking about encounters, like real things that happened. And, you know, um, the guy who led me to the Lord, he, he said early on, we would start talking or he's had all kind of experiences and this was early on again. And, uh, he kind of got in this way. He's like, you got to be careful sharing these experiences because you find Christians who get into these like, well, I seen this. Oh yeah. Well, I'm able to do this. Well, I did this. And I, and uh, and so he told me that years ago and then ta talking to some people, they're like, I could summon aliens on cue. I can open up portals right now. And what? And they were just like, we're just having a regular conversation and they're trying to one up me. And I'm like, Oh, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do that with you. You know what I'm saying? So it's like this weird, like, you know, what you've seen and, and going, you know, deeper and deeper and deeper with it. Um, have you noticed any of that stuff? It would, the, the scary yeah. thing that I find, especially I've done over 300 episodes. Now, the scary thing is, is the psychological <laughs> stuff behind it. And especially <laughs> like people trying to people making up, like oh, stories yeah. or just because they imagined it, they felt like they really experienced it versus like, did you really, cause I can, you know, I, I got, I know people who can say, Oh yeah, I can see angels all in this room right now. And they're just, it's because they have an overactive imagination. God uses the imagination. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there is that. I think that if you believe it, that then you can encounter it. Um, you have the same effects it has the same effect on you, whether it's if it was really there or not. Like if you feel like you really encountered seven angels that are at, that you see at all times or whatever. But I feel like there's this like who is more far out and who is more mystical. I know you've been in it for this long. You've definitely encountered that. Maybe it's leveled <laughs> out a little bit now, but you've definitely encountered that, right? Yeah. I mean, to me, that's a person that has an orphan mentality. Like I've got to outdo everybody else because I really feel pretty insecure. Yeah. And it's usually a person that's pretty isolated too. And isolation is governed by deception. Like there's, especially with this stuff, we've got to do this in community with a company of people that have the opportunity. I call them editors. You know, I don't like the word accountability when it comes to relationships. If we're talking about money and accounting, it's great, but if we're talking about relationships, I need an editor who comes in, has permission to, to make my story better. They can write in the red, red marks in my margins of my life and be able to say, hey, here's a run-on sentence. Let's put a period. Yeah. And if we don't have those types of people in our life, we're, we're going to be led to places of deception because we will have tunnel vision. And we'll think we are amazing when there might be something that needs to be addressed. And that's where an editor comes in. So it's super important, yeah. especially as people explore the world that God has given us. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some people positioned in our life that have that permission. Um, I definitely see where you're talking to there about just life in general, especially with spirituality and making sure we're not so far gone because people get into weird stuff and they abandon <laughs> the faith. Jesus yeah. was just a space brother. You know, he's one of us or, you know, and then there's no, you know, work on the cross meant, meant nothing. I mean, people, they change and they start. It, it happens really quick. You know, who has so easily bewitched you, you know, from yeah. from, from the, the simplicity of the gospel. And that's one thing I think that in all of this stuff, we have to make sure that we're talking about because um, it, it, it happens. But as far as like having, I think we are pioneers, right? I think that if you can dream something up if you can imagine it then i think you can encounter it i really feel like this reality works in that type of way if you believe it you can see it um and, and even so for like art art and stuff like that with like pioneering pioneering into like different realms of music is what i do so uh, most of my friends and 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 it was different you know and they, they couldn't get it and they would say i wouldn't don't do it don't put it out there like that but it has to be something of like you have to be you have to hear his voice you know what i'm saying you have to get the vision and run with it and 
for those who are really pioneering, the majority of the time, like, hey, like they're not going to understand it until because I think a lot of times we're just we're years a- ahead of, of a lot of stuff that's going on. You know what I'm saying? So um, usually they catch up with it later or you can be saying something that you believe in and you're encountering in the spirit and they, people just, OK, that's Brian or whatever. He's just he's always been that way. But their favorite pastor says it. And now it's like, oh, yeah, now we're getting back into the stars, into the Zodiac, because my yeah. pastor's teaching on it. And you've been talking about <laughs> this for like 10 years or something, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, being a pioneer is not for everybody, but it's, yeah. you know, I, I would I would actually say we're probably more reformers. You know, I think a reformer is just I'm, rediscovering the path that's been you. grown over. Yeah. It's not something new, of course. It's nothing new. Yeah. And then a pioneer comes on that trail that's still not, still freshly, you know, we've taken the weeds off. We've, we now have a trail. The pioneers come and start to build the infrastructure so that settlers can come and build upon and really thinking about building a city, a place for, our, for large groups of people to come into and re enter the revelation that's been lost. Yeah. Is kind of how I, I liken this. And but as a reformer, as a pioneer, people you're misunderstood. People don't understand what you're doing. You're you're gonna be accused. You're gonna be. That's why it's not for everybody. Yeah. And so for me, it's like I have to always come back to, hey, this is not just about me. This is about a future generation. Yeah. That this is they're gonna be their normal, and I'm willing to go down that path if it means people will grow up with this is their reality it's not that's crazy that's fringe no this is normal christianity and that to me is worth it yeah i'm I'm with you man there's like uh you know i remember when i started going pretty deep and just looking into different philosophy and you know things like that um but still having a biblical basis and stuff and i was just beginning to be vocal about you know, all kinds of out there stuff that I was experiencing versus just keep it to yourself, man. Um, you kind of, you get marked early on. It's, it gets, you get separated by yourself. You know, it's a way that yeah. Satan has a way to sift you as we, you know, to get you by yourself. But um, I remember hearing so many sermons that like my pastor would say like, uh, you know, when the Holy Spirit gets you, nobody's going to understand you. It's going to just be you. You got to take the call. Nobody's going to understand it, but you got to stick with it. And then finally, when it's like you step into the thing you've been hearing for years and they're like, no, 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 that's not what we meant. It's like, what do you mean? Like, this is <laughs> this is my thing. This is the call. This is what I'm pursuing. It always comes full circle as long as you're um, um, faithful with it and try not to burn as many bridges as you can, which is easy for yeah. a lot of people to do you know, and, and whenever that, that happens of, of pioneering. But again, I'm with you about it. I don't think it's nothing new and, and, or, you know, we have a lot of people who are into the next stage and and what's coming and things like that. So I do think that we're in a transition period, but as me personally, I'm not trying to like invent new ways or do new things. Like I want what they had, you know what I'm saying? Then I think we'll be living the ascended life. They had so <laughs> many cool spiritual technologies that they understood. Um, that was their birthright given from God. And they walked in it, whether it was the dark ages or the reformation and the Catholic, a little bit of all of it that just kind of mixed this up. And we got this weird offshoot brand of Christianity. Yeah. Um, but I think we're, we're getting back to it. And I've been talking a lot lately about like people feel like it's new but they're finding these old um, mystical sects of people. I even like look into like the Quakers and the Shakers yeah. and stuff and how they were like into this mystical uh, realm of sitting in silence until God showed up. And then they would have these exuberant ways of worship and dance and praise and stuff. And it's like reading about their experiences. It's like, this was hundreds of years ago. These people were getting into this stuff and it's like, we're getting back into that or people finding mystics who were part of the Catholic church and reading some of their stuff about these encounters that they would have. And so we feel like we're stepping into it and we're breaking into new ground, but we're just like revisiting some of the stuff that's been lost. Yeah. Last month I was with uh, a group of charismatic Catholics in Michigan. They wanted me to teach on cloud of witnesses and a bunch of stuff, but man, the hunger in the room, 
And I remember, I don't remember exactly what I said, but this lady blurts out, we, we totally understand we're already mystics, we're Catholics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, they have yeah. such a history of this. Yeah. There's already a grid and to see them just kind of enter in. And for me, I, I was kind of really moved. And I said, you know, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Catholic mystics. I mean, they, they, they paved a way for where it we are was today. The, it was what we call the church, where, no matter what you believe, like that's yeah. what everything, whether they were true believers in there and unbelievers, you know, the wheats and the tares together, whatever you believe, like they, that they were real believers in there at, at some point and, and still are. Cause some people Absolutely. would say, Oh, we, it, they don't believe like us. They're different. Blah, 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 blah. Like this was what we would call the church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, there was a large crucifix on the stage, but if you were to, if you didn't see that and you were to walk into this meeting, you'd never know. I mean, the worship was just like oh, yeah. it was just like I'm at a charismatic conference, right? <laughs> and so it's just it was it was awesome to be with them and experience that. Yeah, it's something about being open and being more inclusive. Like, was that something that you had to come come to terms with? Were you ever really dogmatic about the faith and about the Bible and about belief systems or? Oh yeah, and man. I mean, to, like, I went to a Bible college. <laughs> being more, yeah, just listening versus like talking all the time kind of thing. Or how, how did that happen for you? Yeah. I mean, the Bible college I went to is pretty legalistic. And so there you kind of, you, I kind of caught this hubris about my faith and that man, what I believe is really the right thing. Yeah. And it wasn't until that one encounter I referenced in Brownsville that everything changed because I mean, it really, for about four years, I was very arrogant about what I believed. And if anyone didn't believe like it, it's like, you're, you're out of the loop. And then out of that encounter, which really was a love encounter. I just was like, man, wow. I actually started loving people <laughs> so instead of loving the idea. There. Yeah. I, I loved the idea of people coming to Christ more than I actually loved people. Yeah. Or being right. <laughs> that makes I, sense. Yeah. Being right. Like I found like, like, it kind of like validates your your unbelief the more people that yeah. you can get to believe it you know what i'm saying yeah. whether it's uh, whatever doctrine it is you believe or whatever is agreed upon there's a lot of people who are still insecure they don't even know if they believe it themselves but the more people that you can convince or whatever to check that box then it makes you feel a little bit more validated yourself um absolutely what 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 <laughs> a year was it that you went to to brownsville again 90 i think it was 95 so you pretty had quick a, after it started. Okay, so you had a big change then. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, so, I was lifted a foot off the ground. No one was touching me, and I was slammed on the ground. Wow! And so that got my attention. <laughs> Man, I remember when I came to the Lord, I would spend times in in worship, and uh, and I would feel like I was floating. I don't think I ever did, but I remember asking a dude who was discipling me. I was like, dude, is there any stories of like? <laughs> people levitating like during worship because i really feel like i'm about to take off like i'm just out of this world he said no there are none there's no that's not not a thing and i was like i was kind of let down little (laughs) did i know that there are stories of people again going back to the catholic the catholics and the mystics they they would hover they would fly it would float you know um which is interesting you know i've always just (laughs) organically felt that there was some kind of mystical Versus it all being in your mind kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? You can only yeah. see this with your eyes closed and it has no power in, in physical reality. There's a story of Bobby Connor. I don't know if you know who that mm-hmm. is, but he was in Brazil and the stage was like pretty high up, like 10 foot stage. And he he's just preaching, walking around and people are like gasping over and over. And he's like, what is people's problem? He had walked off the stage, but was floating at the same level of the stage Mm. so when he'd come off the stage he wouldn't drop and he'd come back onto the stage you know and he's he was kind of underwear but you know thousands of people in this room were like what the he's like he's levitating 10 feet above the ground wow um (laughs) there's some of the uh, experiences at brownsville i think they we're talking about being spoiled i think they spoiled me early on those (laughs) brownsville encounters and um when As in born, your backyard. Yeah, when I got born again, I really got born again. Like we would just do after church, would we'd do prayer meetings, you know, laying hands on people, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and we we kind of like at church, we couldn't wait for church to be over. Like we love corporate <laughs> worship and meeting everybody, but we were kind of recruiting people to like. It was almost like the deep people, like, hey, you want more? 
this is good. Yeah. But you want more? Follow us. We're going to meet here. And we would go and we'd tap in and just, man, in somebody's little apartment somewhere, you know. And uh, and then we'd take weekend trips to, to Brownsville. And uh, kind of like what you were talking about, like I, I remember, you know, sits with me, uh, thousands of people, you know, people couldn't even get into this huge church, you know. And uh, it was like 12 o'clock, one in the morning, they're ready to go home. And so the, the the ministers and pastors and traveling evangelists who were speaking the stuff and on the prayer teams, like they were trying to leave and go to their vehicle and they were like going out through the hallway and there's just a mob of kids chasing them. <laughs> and the kids are just grabbing their coats, pulling them, pray for me, pray for me. And he's trying to run and he's almost like pushing them <laughs> off, like oh, trying to break loose. And he'd turn around and he'd point at them, fire, 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 fire. And literally they would do, 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 do. They'd fall down and shoot back and hit the wall. And then he'd turn around and keep running. And then the rest of the kids still standing, pray for me, pray for me. And they'd throw their hands up and try to get them to turn around and fire, fire, fire. I was one of those kids, man. Like I'm chasing, hey, pray for me. We want somebody to, to say a prayer and, and pray. And the anointing was so strong in that place. Yeah. Like we're talking about being ruined. Like that set the bar really high. So going to church and like being involved with, ministries where it was all about rules and regulations or there was no floor unction of the holy spirit people weren't getting healed set free delivered you know we would talk about these mystical things and people would tell us not to and don't talk about casting out demons and strongholds and some of the deep far out stuff that i, I came into this experiencing that was my normal you know so yeah. anything else that didn't you know, it hit that, that plumb line. It was, it fell short, you know, and I felt like we were being cheated and ripped off even, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I just love the Lord just honors hunger and it's not this, I think there's an orphan type of a hunger too, where we're trying to get something we already have, but yeah. I'm talking about that true hunger. Just like, I just want to experience more of who you are. And I just, I love how the Lord just like, all right, let's do this. Let's go deeper. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, again, like, just it keeps going deeper and deeper. Like, whatever you can believe for, I, I, feel, I feel like you can have. You know, I feel mm -hmm. like it becomes real for you. You know, it's like, uh, whatsoever you shall believe, you know, in my name. And uh, so many scriptures about, you know, wh whatever you ask for, whatever you believe, like, you know, uh, you know, anything, it's, it's, it shall be given unto you. Like, who, like, who are you to tell me what my anything is? Like, you don't know what I've yeah. seen. You don't know what I've <laughs> been through. So for, for some people, they don't even have like the, uh, the, the frame of, of reference to ask for or to believe for anything outside of the box. And so it really gets weird because like, you know, a, I'd say the majority of people haven't even had any mystical encounter. They haven't seen an angel. They haven't seen a demon. They haven't seen a any type of otherworldly being. And so, but once you step into that and you kind of create this landscape to believe the unbelievable for many people, you start having it every day. It becomes an everyday occurrence of mystical and far outs. And so like I got, I wrote a book and it's just full. It's just like one of those experiences again, should I could write a book on and just be infatuated about God and the mystery, but there's so many. It's almost like, a, a spoiled th in response to the mind. And I've seen so many far out things that you wouldn't even believe. And I'm sure you have too, but, uh, it's crazy. I probably it, believe it. <laughs> like, so does it, does it meet your, your level of faith or cause sometimes it's like a divine suddenly you're walking on the road yeah. to Damascus and boom, Jesus shows up and it changes everything. And, um, I think it, that, it usually f starts at somewhere like that. It starts at a Brownsville. I don't want to be here. Boom. Here's Jesus. Hey, what's, you know, we're changing the game, yeah. you know? And then like from there, it kind of like that, I think that that experience, that encounter is a point of reference for new encounters to mm -hmm. go deeper and higher. How does that, you think it work? For yeah, people? for sure. I mean, that, that mugging that I had from God, I still had to make a choice after that to pursue. And so I think, if I were to boil it down to one thing, it's, it's childlike faith. I mean, that, that to me is the key. You know, we're not the adults of God, we're the children of God. And so, you know, for us to have that wonder, that playfulness with God, and I think religion, it's, it is very serious and it demands serious attention. And so we have people and structures that 
it doesn't allow space for childlike faith. And because there isn't space for that, they're not encountering these things. That's why Jesus is pointing to kids. Like, Hey, if you want to enter the kingdom, come into this stuff, you have to be like one of these. And so I, I just try to keep my, 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 myself in that place of curiosity, kind of like the kid who will play in the box, not the toy that came in the box. You know, it's like they find a whole world in that box. It's like, I want to, I want to stay there. Yeah. It's deep. Cause it's almost like they're all like coming to Jesus. Hey, teach us some more, give us some more stuff. And they're like, look, <laughs> Don't ask me. Ask the kids. They, yeah. they can teach you more than I can. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just go learn how the kids are acting. You know, hang out with them. You know, that'll humble you. That'll teach you. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's yeah, beautiful. I always tell my friends who like speak all over. I said, if you can speak to kids, yeah. then you're a good speaker because they're not going to play around. Like if if it's not good, if it's boring, they're going to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> it's a whole different world. I remember early on, like we had to. Um, they asked us to speak to uh, be over like a group of kids at uh, uh, some children's crusade. Uh, b- what is it? Vacation Bible school. And like, we were trying to, so we had all that we can, you know, blow all the, the adults minds. But it came to the kids. We're like, uh, yeah, we're trying to explain these deep concepts. Like, oh, this ain't working. And I knew really quick, like, hold on, this isn't, this isn't working. You know what I'm saying? For the adults, we can, you know, talk. It, it has to be in a way that, your spirituality, your beliefs and things like that could, you know, you could teach it to a kid, you know, yeah. you're a hundred percent. Right. Um, let me ask you about this too, because there's a lot of people, again, I'm, I'm a believer. I uh, believe in the finished work of Christ. And, uh, that's my entry point. Um, there's a lot of people listening who aren't, they haven't had that experience with Christ. They're tapping into a lot of mystical experiences without, uh, Jesus. Um, I think Jesus is a little bit more bigger and, and inclusive now. I think that Jesus is love, that he was love that became a person. And I think that anybody who is operating in unconditional, perfect love is operating in Jesus. That's just how I look at it now, because there's Christians who are operating out of hate, bigotry, jealousy, envy, strife, uh, you know, trying to build your ministry, whatever. And they're not operating in Jesus. So but they're Christians and they go by the title. It doesn't give them a right because it's different. So I think that there's a there's a little bit of a. Uh, it crosses lines there, but where, where, where do you see that as far as like those people who aren't Christians, they haven't had this encounter with Christ. Obviously I bid people to come in and, and, and taste and see that the Lord is good because that's the only way I know to do it. Um, but there yeah. are people operating in love. Maybe they're, maybe they're Buddhist, maybe they're into the new age or something like that. What would you say to those people who are so-called leaving their bodies and having angelic and mystical encounters, you know, and d- demons, angels, everything that, that we're talking about, they're like, yeah, I believe it, but I just don't, I'm not really big on the Jesus thing. What would you say to those people? I have quite a few friends in witchcraft. I have one, it's like a ninth generation witch. And so they, they have lots of encounters you know, in meetings, sometimes they'll come when I'm speaking. They're like, oh, I saw this going on in the meeting. And it's like, and what they're describing is 100% correct. And so for some of them, they entered through blood. And so the, the blood stuff is huge because really the blood is the way into the heavenly realms. And of course, Jesus, his blood is of the highest order. And so people can have very real encounters. Um, for me, it's like, it just comes down to the source code. It's where's the source code at? Because again, if I'm if I'm being led and it's not the finished work of Christ, who is the apex of love and the apex of light, that I'm going to be led to other places. And so the great thing about Jesus is he said, hey, when he was on the earth, I'm leaving, but it's going to be better because there's one coming and he's our guide. You know, I would even call him the great spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit. He He's leading us into places of truth. And so I can be led into places and it's either going to be truth or it's not. And Jesus is, is the full measure of truth that can be known. And so there can be pieces of that. And so I, I love it when people are encountering pieces of the truth. Mm-hmm. And then I have an opportunity, whether it's a conversation, prayer, whatever, to be like, hey, this is the power of Jesus in my life and there's opportunities to get to know him. And I'll just share one story. I had this friend that was a, a witch. I started talking about the great spirit and she's like, Oh, the great spirit. Like 
yeah, you can talk to the great spirit. It's like, I'd like to talk to the great spirit. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, you know, well, great spirit's going to lead you to Jesus. It's what he does. And so she, um, I think it was the next day, called and said, hey, the, the colors are brighter. The vibrational frequencies are higher as I've talked to the great spirit. And I was like, yeah, just keep having conversations with him. And so to me, it's like if I can help a person see that there there is someone behind all of this that is sustaining all of creation, that is holding everything together, and that there's an opportunity to connect, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, we get caught up on the Christian thing or the Jesus thing and the fact that it matters. That's not even his name, Jesus. Like, you know, <laughs> we use it and the, the world knows who we're talking about. Um, some people have transcended that and they won't even respond to that name they think you're calling on zeus and just all of these different belief systems and stuff with uh with the name of jesus but you can i think love is his name you know what i'm saying is god with us he's here like yeah. dwelling amongst us and uh and he made a, a, a way for us to kind of transcend and overcome our sins and overcome the things that are killing us you know what i'm saying and so that we uh we don't have to fear we don't have to worry we don't have to uh, you know, live in defeat because love became a person and showed us how to do it and did it for us, you know, just so yeah. he, 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 uh, bridged that gap. And so, um, it's the fruit, you know what I'm saying? I think at the end of the day, it's the fruit. I would r much rather hang out with a spiritual Hindu than with a carnal Christian. I'm just saying, Oh yeah, I'm with <laughs> I, you. I probably have more in common and we can have more conversations than arguing with someone who just wants to debate me on philosophy and theology and prove that I'm right and want to know what, what my tattoos are abomination to God, you know, and all these kind of conversations that it's like i used to be a part of those conversations to, just to let you know but um at this point I'm, i want to go where the love is right as far as like who i have yeah. in my circle and what what tables that i want to eat from is love unconditional love no matter what package that comes in and i think uh i think romans one and two talks about um that god is is showing himself to, to all all people uh through through nature and through the sunset and through so those people who there are people who are talking to the the divine spirit, the great spirit that is within all and through all. And they're, I think they're talking to the father God. Um, there was a Do I have time a, to tell you a crazy story. No, we were I'll just reminded. Time. We got to go now. Nah, go ahead. We do. It's not my story. It's a friend, but he, he lives in the Philippines. His wife is Filipino and he makes instruments for a living. And then they just kind of share the goodness of Jesus out of what they're doing. And so he has this dream a few years back of this instrument it's like a bowl with probably 60 strings on top and in this dream there's this mountain this guy walks up in the mountain this this guy and so he wakes up and he's googling he can't find anything about this tribe goes to an anthropological center they're like this tribe doesn't exist there's no there's nothing no reference to this tribe so then he starts trying to make this instrument he eventually makes it takes him like I think six months to actually get it done. And then he's kind of at this bus station or called jeepneys over there. And he sees this guy and God says, go ask him about the tribe. And he says, Hey, have you ever heard of this tribe? And this guy's eyes get really big. He goes, that's my tribe. And he's like, this is a real tribe. He's like, yeah, there's like a hundred thousand of us in the mountains. He's like, dude, do you, do you have like a chief or something? He's like, yeah. He goes, can I come with you? I want to bring a gift. So they go up there. They almost die on this cliff end up making it there and they get to the chief of the chiefs and he says, I have a gift for you. And he brings out this bowl and the chief starts freaking out because where did you get this? How did you make this? Because I had this dream, blah, blah. So the chief, that one, this angel appears and then there's this blank spot on the wall. And he says a hundred years ago, the guy who made the instrument that you have died and no one's been able to replicate it. He goes, now when that instrument is played, the God of all gods shows up. And it's crazy. So th they start to play this thing. And then the glory of God fills this hut. And he says, my friend says, hey, is there anything we can do for your tribe? And my friend had a kind of a Bible sticking out of his pocket. And this guy didn't even know what it was. He goes, whatever that book is, we want it translated in our language. And the God that is the God of that Bible that's the one we want to, we want to go after. And so dude, they translated the Bible, this entire village <laughs> came to Christ. 
but it was this amazing picture that here's this tribe nobody knows about in the middle of the mountains who's having genuine encounters with God. And it's like, how many more people around the world are having true things happen where we might not think, oh, that's truly God, but yet the God of all gods was appearing to them. Yeah, man. Uh, Joel, prophecy of Joel, the Lord said he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. I really think, yeah. I don't think all flesh means Christians. I think the, <laughs> I think that all flesh means, uh, means everybody. And so yeah. I think that uh, some of these spiritual practices and things that we're seeing from around the world, I think they have a piece of the truth. Uh, may not have it all figured out. I don't think that any of them have it all figured out. Heck, I think even Christianity has a piece of that truth as well. You know, mm. so I think that we all yeah. have a piece of it. And so it's about being open and honest and having conversations and, you know, bringing our pieces to the puzzle together. At least it's, that's what's worked for me, you know, to find a, immense peace and joy in my life versus being bitter and always having to be right and having to convert people. And, you know, I, I bid people taste and see that the Lord is good. I can only give yeah. you what I got and, uh, and what's working for me. And I'm going to share it with you and, uh, what's not working, what didn't work. I'm going to be open and honest and share that. And I feel like that if we all do that, then it'll allow us to ascend. It will allow us to, uh, you know, weed out some of those negative patterns and things that we've embraced through Christianity or through whatever religion that you're following that, you know, was about rules and regulations and dogmas that that weren't of Christ to begin with. For some reason, they just kind of weaseled their way in, and we thought it was Jesus, so we thought it was you know how how things were supposed to supposed to go. One of the big things for me that really helped me in my awakening process is was uh, watched an interview. I talk about this a lot uh, with Robert Schuler and uh, Billy Graham, and so and I, I put this at the end of one of my songs just because I wanted to like share it with a lot of people but they're talking about this end time revival and uh and uh robert Shula asked Benny, billy graham about the do you think we're going to see a big end time revival of all of these last reformation where all of these people just come into the body of christ and and they come into the church and all that kind of stuff and and billy graham said no i don't think we're going to see that he said but what i do think that we're going to see is that there's people all over the world who are called by his namesake and are a part of the body of Christ and they don't even know it. He said there's people all across the world and they're part of the body of Christ, they just don't know it. And he said these are people of the Muslim world, of the Hindu world, of whatever, they may have not even have ever heard of the name of Jesus, but they're his. And to hear <laughs> Billy Graham, like one of the greatest evangelists of all of our day, uh, at the end of his road, like he's preached he's probably debated he's talked to every soul he's talked to gandhi like all of these these people and uh at the end of his life he said you know what god has a people for his namesake across and they you wouldn't recognize them if you've seen them if you <laughs> if you're judging them if they're carrying a bible or they name the name of christ but naming the name of christ i think is a little bit more deeper than just saying hey my name's derek i'm a christian naming the name of christ is like departing from evil it's seeking good it's believing all things you know there's so many things that kind of you know set you apart of being what we would call a christian uh walk kingdom here in the chat says that uh, going off of the the quote i said a while ago i'd rather spend time with a spiritual hindu than a carnal christian he said that a uh a uh, carnal Christian is not a Christian, but a spiritual Hindu is really a Christian. <laughs> it's about love, man. It is not about these titles and things and, and that we've kind of, you know, this the, 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 the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares coming up together. Love is the fruit that uh, that we all can partake of. And, and that's how Jesus told us to judge. Judge yeah. according to the fruit. A good tree is going to bring forth good fruit. A bad tree, just hang around that person long enough and you're going to partake of it. You'll get to see. Yeah, man. Jesus is amazing. Good stuff. So, um, man, what do you, what do you have that you're working on right now? What do you, what are you promoting right now? I have a mystical mentorship. We're doing a second round. We, my friend Arun Bolchandani and I did, uh, last May, we started what's called Nura, which is an Aramaic word for light out of Daniel 2.22. And we are doing Nura 2.0. So registration's open for that. Um, I have a Raising Mystics class that just is going to go, registration will go live tomorrow. And that's just my wife and I are going to be helping parents, whether they're biological parents or spiritual parents, 
helping them to help their kids process supernatural phenomenon. That really comes out of my passion because the stuff I was encountering as a kid to help children see that sustained through their whole life, that they don't have to shut that off and become too adult like, but can remain childlike their whole life. And so just helping parents to do that with their kids. And uh, there's a reformation summit this Friday, good Friday online. It's free. I'm doing with uh, some friends of mine that we have a thing called Reformation Alliance. And so it's, it's just a movement that's about helping people to discover whether they're in business, government, education, how to bring reformation to that sphere. So it'll be Friday, I think 530 Pacific Standard Time. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. It'll be super fun. That's awesome. Where can they go to uh, check that out? If you look up uh, the Facebook group, Kingdom Reformers Community, you'll see it there. It'll be posted like on my Facebook stuff too while it's happening live. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, for those who are who are interested in, 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 in I say, mystical experience or tapping into to Christ or tapping into the Father through Christ, what, what is a, a good practice? What is a good way, uh, something that they can do at home for themselves to really... F- have this encounter yeah there's a couple things i kind of teach people like because your your brain becomes kind of the issue in a lot of these things and so you have to retrain your brain to realize the accessibility you have to the kingdom or the heavenly realms and so one thing i'll do is piece of paper construction paper whatever is you know the veil has been torn right jesus boom the heavens are rent they're open so it's ripping a piece of paper walking through that and just declaring i have access to the heavenly realms like it's this easy to walk into this um another one is just uh, putting your one foot in water one foot on the dirt like in a bucket of water and it's like hey i'm i'm seated with christ in the heavenly realm so like that's like the water and my foot's here in the earth so i'm in two places at the same time and so you might think, well, that's kind of a interesting, but it's like you're training your brain is what's happening, which many times is the blockage because your brain's like, this isn't true. This, this can't be happening. I, I can't understand this. And it's like your intellect will not take you where faith will. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm all about being intellectual, but if we have to understand things first, we're going to have a hard time accessing what he's given us. And so again, it's that childlike, and this is just some childlike, playful things we can do with God so our brain can get a clue. That's interesting, man, because like, it's like we need a physical representation of something spiritual, like an analogy. Yeah. And Jesus, Jesus was like this physical representation of a greater love. And it, he showed us how much, you know, that, that uh, love was, you know, that he gave his own life for us and became a ransom and became sin for us. So it's like he's the physical representation of the love of God, which is in heaven. You know, it's yeah. so beautiful. But yeah, those little exercises and things things like that's really cool, man. Um, bro, thanks for hanging out with me. Glad we got to connect, brother. And uh Yeah, uh, man, thanks def- for having definitely me. Definitely need to do it again sometime. Absolutely, man. You're awesome. All right, brother, you too. Be blessed, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, peace. Peace, peace. Brian Orm, ladies and gentlemen. Christian mystic. Mystical experiences. And again, it's like the Christian mystic, and people are like, what does that mean? And because they have these weird ideas of what a Christian mystic is. And again, at the beginning, I said, look, if you're a Christian, you're you're, you've signed on for the mystical experience because Christ relationship with a God that you can't see with an essence um, that through faith allows you to see, allows you to have the framework for the mystical, for the experiences that many of you guys have had have have been having so i think for the majority this is nothing new so it's just you're finding people you're finding your tribe as some would say you're finding people who are telling your story maybe just using different words um the the reason that brian is doing it doing what he does um is why i do what i do is speaking to that younger version of yourself the younger version who was looking for answers who was having mystical experiences and couldn't talk to anyone at church couldn't talk to anyone you had to keep it to yourself don't ask those questions well you find out when you get to heaven that's not for you to know right now but it's a burning desire in, in you to know these things and um 
I always do I always do that, man. I, I I pretend. I don't pretend because I know that the younger version of myself is out there listening to this. You know, I say younger version. I know my demographic is not to it's this isn't for teenagers. Um, I know who my dem- demographic is, but you know those who are in their twenties, who are in their thirties, man. They just shoot. I say, man, we got people. Maybe the older version of myself. There's people who are 50, 60, 70 year old tapping into what we're doing, you know. And they they're now looking for a framework. They're looking for references to explain what they've experienced. And so there's a huge aspect of what I do is just for that. Another aspect is um, what is possible. Many people don't even know this is possible, right? And they want more. They're seeking more, but they're this is it. You want more, you seek more, but you go to a Reformed Baptist church. Good luck. Now, I ain't dissing nobody, but let's bring it to the light. Like, it's, you, you, only, you, can't, you can't grow beyond, uh, you know, you can't expand beyond that realm of what you're placed in. If you have a, uh, a bucket, like he was talking about, and you pour that living water in the bucket, what happens when you reach the top of that bucket? You're going to overflow. Or you, but you, you're only gonna be able to carry and contain whatever was in that bucket. You need a bigger bucket. So whatever uh, denomination that you have signed up for, you got to know that Christ. You got to know that God is bigger than your denomination, and that goes for all of them. You got to know that, and so for, you have to expand it because you can't put old wine into new wine skins lest they burst. We're trying to carry the new wine. In an old wineskin, it's going to break. It's going to burst. Just like if you try to fill a bucket up. Most of us, like we fill up the old flimsy buckets and you're walking around with it. The handles break off. You can't even carry it. It's just got to stay there because you can't. You're going to spill the water out. So you have to understand that really. I think what the mystical experience shows you is that, yeah, you can carry that water. But God is not just that water. God. Is the bucket. God is the table that the bucket is sitting on. God is the house that the table is in. God is the foundation. God is the earth. God is the, he's in all and through all. So you have to zoom out. We're all zoomed in. We have to zoom out and understand that God is more inclusive and he's bigger than just my portion or what, what I'm into or what I believe. And so that's the entry point for a lot of people. Is the, they come into this understanding that they thought they had it all figured out. I thought I knew. <laughs> I thought I knew, man. That was a thing. <laughs> like, uh, you know, in our, our uh, men's retreat some years ago, going into a otherworldly uh, medicine experience. And I, was, I remember looking at Drew. I thought I knew, man. I thought I knew. I didn't know nothing. And it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and more mystical. And it's beautiful, though. But again, those experiences are about going in, grabbing something and applying it to your life, being a better person. Manly P. Hall. I love him. He says, if the state of your of your dog isn't better, if his living conditions aren't better, then your uh, spirituality is in vain. If dad still kicks the dog on the way out the door, his Church service meant nothing. How many people do you know? This was a big thing that after church service, they had a, they heard a good word, a good message. They heard God. They get in the car. They start fighting. It's like they just holding it in. They holding that evil in during the service. Maybe they want help, but they get into the car. They just start arguing. You're slapping the kids and throwing stuff and arguing with. Them. I've seen it, man. Your it has your spirituality, your change, your repent. You have to bring forth meat worthy of repentance you're not a better person your religious beliefs your conspiracy theories have kind of made you bitter they've made you live in fear they've made you live in worry and doubt you are not a better person you you're, you need to check what you believe at the door because you're paranoid you're the only one with the truth you and your church y'all are the only ones that got it you know all of these things that hold on man this ain't the way it's supposed to be. Well, brother, the Bible says that only a few, a few people are getting into the kingdom. And it's all, and you think the few is you and your church. Man, if you don't get out of my face with that. All of and it. That's every religion. That's every denomination. That they're the only ones that write and, the, and are right. And the other ones, the way that they do it is wrong. 
Um, if anybody has any questions, let me know. I'll try to answer them here in the in the chat. We've just done over an hour. Thanks everybody for hanging out. But if you guys have any questions about anything, shout out to Delvin, Javier, uh, Love, Learn, Grow, Ali, Walk Kingdom, G's, Bees. I think well, I don't want to miss anybody. There's a bunch of people. Christy, Martha, all y'all. Shout out Ali. Uh, G's, Bees says, "Are tattoos Christian?" I don't think they are. I don't think that tattoos are Christian. You can have a tattoo that reminds you of your Christianity. I have a tattoo that says testify. It's from the POD album. I love that. Testify. So I don't think your tattoos are Christian, but you can have a tattoo that reminds you of your Christianity. They're symbols. They are uh, things that we have in our life of necklaces and trinkets and pictures of Jesus or a cross necklace. I don't think your cross necklace is a a Christian necklace. I think that your cross necklace reminds you of the finished work that Christ did for you on the cross. So they're, they're reminders. Um, So I think that, uh, I think that's how it works. I don't think that you can have a Christian. We used to be really big in, in the music. Like when I was in the bands and stuff, when I played in metal bands and we had, we was like, are you a Christian band? Are you Christians in a band? Is that a Christian band or are you Christians? Like, well, if the lead singer is a Christian, then they're a Christian band. And we used to like book shows and stuff. And I have to book, I'd book shows at churches and be like, well, I think the lead singer is a Christian. So they're, therefore they're a Christian band. And these little hoops and is that Christian? Is this not, is this God? Is it this not? I think we have to get away from that is and, and judge by the fruit. And at the end of the day, the fruit I think is love. It's peace, it's long suffering, it's gentleness, it's meekness, like the fruit of the spirit. Look at what that is. And um, you find people who aren't Christian, but they're walking in those fruits. And uh, and they, they have the heart within them, which the Bible talks about as uh, cries out, Abba, Father. They know that they need a savior. That's what the thing that uh, that Billy Graham was talking about. There's these people all over the world. They know that they need something outside of themselves. They don't know what it is, but they're trying. And maybe they got involved in a different religion or a different belief system. Maybe they're in AA. You know, they're not religious, but they're in AA. Well, you know what? God's responding to AA because you know what? AA works. The system works if you work it, no matter what it is. Your Christianity works if you work it. Your new age works if you work it. Your Buddhism works if you work it. You know what I'm saying? But um, any of them. But again, if it works, if you work it the right way, if it's, Leading you towards love, that's working. Not leading you to be a a hateful person, you know, a bigot, scared of people who are different than you, any of that stuff. I, it really is about being more inclusive. At the end of the day, love keeps no records of wrong. Love does not boast, you know. Read the Corinthians, it talks about love, what love is, and uh, you give you a good idea of what God is. So let's see here. Yeah, we're talking about Brownsville, man. We had so many cool experiences at Brownsville, and it really set the bar high for me in my uh, in my Christianity. Like that was the that was the plumb line, man. Um, Love Learn Grow says, "Could you pray, brother? I have been attacking others just because they don't believe the same exact. Not about being right. At the end of the day, it's about walking in love." Jesus says, have you dabbled with the idea of being a Mormon? Not even one time. Maybe looking into the story of Joseph Smith and some of the interesting things that he says, I look in, I, I dabble with the idea of angelic contact. And so he talks about these angels and who, who appeared to him and brought him some tablets and things like that. So, um, but I could pray for sure. Um, Choose your battles wisely. I mean, there is a time where you need to stick up for what you believe and you need to, you know, clear people out of your your life if they're not, you know, if they're pulling you down. You know what I'm saying? You got to examine yourself to make sure that you're in the faith and examine your relationships. But tolerance is huge. Um, well, I remember seeing the uh, when the bumper stickers came out that coexist. And it was around 2012 that I was like, man, I uh I fell in love with it, you know, just the idea of coexisting with others because and not because it was big for me. 
because I was like very judgmental. I was very dogmatic. So to be open and be able to be around these person, to live with these people and not want to debate, to want to um, talk them out of their belief systems or tell them why it's demonic or whatever the case is. Um, once I came to that understanding, it was so much peace entered my life. So I got a um, um, coexist. I think I had a T-shirt. I had a bumper sticker. But all my Christian friends were freaking out. Dude, coexist. What do you mean coexist? You're saying that all these ways are right. You're saying that all these ways are different ways to God. Not all spokes lead to the same wheel. Why are you saying that? I was like, hold on. I'm not saying that. I don't know. I've never been a Muslim. I don't know where that road leads. I've never been a Hindu. I don't know where that road. So, no, I'm saying what the bumper sticker is saying. We need to coexist. We need to live together peaceably. And then I found scriptures in the Bible that says, if it's at possible, strive to seek peace with all men. That's how oh, the Bible says that the Bible talks about coexist, live peaceably with all men. Then I found another scripture. Paul said, look, speak evil of no man. And I found out that that's what that's what we were doing debating and and saying what was right and what was the right way and what when you know which religion is right we we're speaking evil of people we're distancing ourselves from people because they believe differently and it was going on within christianity and it was going on in in our denomination and it was going on with the religion and all of that stuff so um coexist living peaceably with people um, I think it shows a lot of long suffering. I, sh I think it shows a lot of temperance. It shows a lot of patience, which is the fruit of the spirit. Because you know those people who can't do it, and maybe you yourself can't do it right now. But uh, it should be something you can work on and just engage in those conversations, man. Not to prove what you know that you're right or to, to convert somebody or whatever the case is, but just to be a good person, man. be a good person but i will go ahead and end this episode with a prayer for anybody who is dealing with that um in general and just whatever else that you're dealing with because we're dealing with uh strange and perilous times right now but we do have a peace in christ that surpasses all understanding the world didn't give it and they can't take it away so be of good cheer. Jesus says, I've overcome the world. And we have his peace. So, Father, I just thank you for your love, God. I thank you for your grace uh, that you extend freely to those, Lord, who would receive it. Father, I just pray that uh, whoever's listening to this, who needs it, that they would just position their hearts right now in a uh, position to receive your love wherever they are. Steady now their hearts right now just to receive your love, to receive your grace and your peace that flows freely from heaven. Freely from heaven down to our hearts, Lord. Father, that their hearts would be open and they would continuously be a conduitly, they would continuously be a conduit for your love to flow to them and through them to other people. They don't have to be right. They don't have to win an argument. They don't have to win a debate. But they could just walk in love, Lord. And you said that love covers a multitude of sins, Lord. Long suffering. They can't talk to any, anyone else, Lord. They already have a bad taste in their mouth for, for Christians and church people. And they stay away from those people for good reason. Lord, that my friends who are listening to this would be a standard. That they would change the narrative for the way that the world looks at Christianity or the world that looks at followers of Jesus. I pray, though, Lord, that you just release that upon them. Spirit of long suffering, peace, being more patient. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen. Love you guys. Christy posted a scripture says Mark 9 38 Jesus said who is never whosoever is not against us is for us amen 
Good stuff, y'all. Thanks for hanging out. Really enjoyed this this uh, episode. Been trying to make this work with Brian Orm for uh, some time now. It was cool to be able to finally do it. So it's really cool. Got a bunch of awesome interviews lined up. We're going to stay faithful with the work that God has given us and bringing some really cool stuff to the table. I'm still working on some courses and my own um, things that uh, I'm trying to get out to really articulate some of the, the ways that uh, – we engage with the spirit. I'm working on like, it's, it's kind of crazy. I need to <laughs> focus, but I'm working on about 17 different things at one time. And, uh, with that being said, it's inching on. There's not a lot of, uh, uh stuff getting accomplished, uh, with that. But I just try to be with that. I just try to like, whatever the inspiration that comes to me, whatever it is, like it has to go to a certain, you have to like put it in a filing cabinet and compartmentalize it. Okay, this goes to that. Okay, this goes to that. Versus sitting down and trying to get all the info uh, and, and spend time on it, which I know I need to do. And I did that yesterday with my good friend Tarek, uh, kind of being mentored by him and in, in some of the, these uh, podcasting video app that you're listening to. If you're listening to this on YouTube, click subscribe, click notifications, follow me on social media, um, the podcasting apps, Apple iTunes, Spotify, whatever it is, just so you get notified the next time we go live and new content is being released. Again, check out my Patreon if you want to be a, a member and get in on some of the extra stuff. Check it out, patreon.com backslash truthseeker. See you guys in Discord. Link is in the description. Follow me over there. Peace, peace. Love you guys. Later. Yo. That does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.